much indeed. Thank you very much indeed. Now, are we still on the morning? Morning, everyone. Afternoon, everyone. How are you? Now, come on. You could do better than that. How are you? Come on. We're supposed to be in the learning space here. One more time. How are you? Good. Excellent. Well, I am uh, delighted to join you here. Um, and uh, as you've already heard, my name is uh, David Mead. And I suppose I should give you a little bit of an introduction to me. I know tons of you won't know who I am. Uh, first and foremost, though, um, in my career, um, I was uh, an academic. And although I'm not a full-time academic these days, it's still uh, the most rewarding job I've ever had. I absolutely loved being a full-time academic, and I, I really, really miss it. Um, but it uh, really was the ground, uh, grounding and the predication and the foundation of everything that you'll see me do over the course of the next four four and a half hours in this session. Um, so I, I think it's only fair though that I should give you a proper introduction to me. Um, as you've heard already, uh, my field was actually international business in the University of Ulster and I was really passionate about it. I loved it um, and I was fascinated by, this was kind of my field of uh, interest and expertise over here, um, looking at what we called in the school soft skills. So everything from decision making, what is it that makes a fantastic decision? One that you can stand by, not only at the point that you make it, but across the entire life of that decision. Uh, motivation, that tiny little fire that separates two employees on the same desk, looking at the same window on the same pay scale, but for some reason performing dramatically differently. What is it that separates those? Um, sales and change management, I do a huge amount of change work in public service. I uh, designed the largest engagement programs that have ever happened in Ireland around the reorganisation of the councils, delivered those. Oh, body language interpretation? which I have already started in this room and will diagnose all manner of fairly deep-seated emotional and relationship issues by the time my session is finished, sir. Um, um, and goals and planning. Did you know that some goals, just by the way that they're written, are dramatically more or less likely to be achieved? Just by the way that they're written and communicated. Now, we call these soft skills. The reason we call them soft skills, or sometimes I call them mindful business skills, if I'm speaking to a sort of a non-university academic audience, essentially, it doesn't matter where you are inside the organization. At the leadership level, top strategic level, operational level, or anywhere in between, these will have application to you. And I promise you, by the end of my session today, you will leave with something that you can use. Because when I was a full-time academic, I used to attend somewhere between one and two conferences a month for networking, or as we called it, not working. And I used to take fantastic notes, really, someone's writing down that joke, uh, fantastic notes. They would sit in the passenger seat of my car for four or five days, then slowly move to the back seat of the car for another six or seven days, then end up in that little pocket behind the passenger seat for another two weeks. I would find them three weeks later. Later, read, they would get covered in yogurt. I didn't even have kids at the time. Who knows how that happened? And I would read the notes and not be able to interpret them at all. Well, I promise you, you don't need to take notes. You will leave with something today that you can use this afternoon, tomorrow, next week. Um, also, that this kind of led into me having a TV show um, uh, for the last five years. If you haven't seen it, I want you to know that that is deeply offensive to me because um, it's watched by nearly 12 people every single week, which you know makes me kind of a big deal in the ghetto in Belfast. Um, um, and in it, I kind of play the part of a mind reader. So a little bit like Darren Brown, I do everything that Darren does, except I do it, you know, cheaper and gayer. Um, I, I will say, um, uh, but the, the reason I say that is, uh, every time uh, someone meets my wife in the supermarket, they always say, oh, he's, he's married, is he? Uh, so anyway... Um, I am married. Uh, I'm married to Elaine. Um, I've been married to Elaine for um, her dad's land. Uh, Elaine and I are what's called in Northern Ireland a mixed relationship, which if you're not originally from Northern Ireland, that means that I was raised a Catholic and Elaine is going to burn in hell. Um, we... Uh, the reason I give you that bit of an introduction to me is because my session is interactive. It is going to be fun, and I know when someone says that this session is going to be interactive and fun, you sit there and you say, this is not going to be fun. It's not going to be fun, but I promise you, it will be fun. Um, I will be, uh, some of you will be taking part, um, and the reason I give you some information about me, because I'm going to be trying to work out some information about you uh, as we move on. So, uh, we will be covering all of these areas. The other thing that I will say is, everything that I cover is based on evidence, um, and fact that 
comes from some form of research that I've either been involved in or, or uh, reported on at some point or at least uh, explored as a, um, as a researcher. The reason I say that is some of the results that we talk about are, are massive and extraordinary and a lot of people say, oh gosh, that's impossible. Even some parts of it are a tiny little bit touchy-feely, hug a tree, work like a pony. Um, but I promise you, it isn't new age. It is all based in evidence and science. For me, new age is only one letter away from sewage. So it is all evidence-based. Um, but I know, um, having spent quite a lot of time working with uh, Gareth and the team on this event, I know the context, I suppose, that you're all dealing with at present. And I think it's really common across a lot of organizations, but I think in your sector in particular, I know that there uh, change, and I know this makes you vomit and nauseous change is the only constant, but the fact is it's true. There is an upward pressure on productivity and a downward pressure on budgets, and the ability to reconcile the gap between those things is incredibly challenging, but I do think it's possible. I really do, if you just look at these challenges in a slightly different way, and that starts now. I know this is going to be the most excruciating 60 seconds of your day, but go with me. Everyone stand up for me. Stand up. Already wish you stayed at home, I know. Now, everyone, shake out your hands for me. Shake out your hands. Now, there are quite a lot of very cheap jewellery in the room, so try not to touch anyone as you're doing this. I want you to turn your hands. Your thumbs are pointing down for me, please. Thumbs are pointing down. Then place your right hand on top of left, right on top of left, and interlock your fingers. Now, there are a couple of rules. Sorry, you need to keep them nice and straight for me. Yes, so nice and straight, if you could keep them out. So at a nice 90-degree angle from your body, don't bend your elbows, don't unlock your fingers, and don't let your arms drip or droop. Now, for the next 63 minutes, no, not really, uh, without unlocking your fingers or bending your elbows, turn your hands, your thumbs are pointing up. I'll give you a couple of minutes. It's this till 3 o'clock. No, no one, no one, and you can give yourselves a round of applause, you take a seat, give yourself a round of applause, or not, whatever, up to you. No, no, give yourselves a round of applause, well done, well done. Now, one of two things happened there. I communicated a really simple message to all of you, and either you, re you received too much information or you received too little information. This happens every single time we communicate inside and outside our organizations. Now, in those gaps, there are huge challenges. When you're asking for resources inside your organization, when you're asking for support, all day we've been hearing about um, you need to achieve more with either resources that you already have or even less. And in those gaps, it makes it really difficult for, uh, for you to properly and effectively present the things that you need so that you can increase your likelihood of getting a yes. The fact, though, is that, that little gap is challenging, but when you know and understand what it is, you can exploit it, and you can use it as an opportunity to dramatically increase your likelihood of getting that yes and getting those things that you need. But it is all predicated in this context of change, and change affects us all in, in uh, very different ways. I know for me, even um, when I look at my own business now, still do quite a lot with the university of Ulster, love them uh, dearly and do as much for them as I possibly can, but I travel a lot, so much now. My entire business is run by what you might call, uh, you know, BYOD, but mobile devices myself. I have a, an iPad that sits in my bag, I travel around with it, my VAT is done on it, my CRM is done on it, all of my taxes are done on it. There's no games on it whatsoever, what a loser. Uh, I sit on airplanes doing tax instead of uh, playing games. And I'll be honest with you, even from a, a pattern of work point of view, this thing sits on my lap every single evening when I'm home. Um, not a single game on it. I must be the only man in the country who, when he's sitting there with his iPad on his lap in the evening, the angry bird is beside me on the sofa. But those, those patterns have affected us in lots of different ways. So I thought it would be fun to try a little test just to see how that change has affected you as well. I'm going to show you. Now, one or two of you will have seen this before. If you have seen it before, very important, don't tell the answer to the person to your left or to your right, um, uh, because if you do do that, that is breaking the rules, and I can make you wet the bed. That's one of my things. Uh, so you're going to watch two teams playing basketball, one team in white, one team in black. Your job is to count on your fingers how many times the team in white passed the ball. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make?
And we will pause it there. I think the most excruciating way to get to the bottom of this is with a show of hands, if we could just bring the house lights up. Raise your hands if you think there were ten passes. Nice and high, ten passes nice and high. Uh, we've got one hand up there. Sir, as you look around the room, you can see you're wrong. Uh, raise your hand for 11 passes. Anyone for 11? Uh, no one there. Anyone for 12? Nice and high for 12? A few for 12. Anyone for 13? Oh, hello armpits. Hello. Uh, anyone for 14? 14? A few for 14. 15? If you got 16 or above, don't raise your hand. That does point to underlying mental health issues. Um, we can deal with that in a different session. Uh, but the correct answer... The answer is 13. Round of applause for those who got 13, anything? Well done, 13s. Oh, do you hear that, 13s? That's bitterness you hear in that applause. Mm, got it right, did you? Good for you. Um, if we could bring the house lights down just one more second. Um, so you got 13, so well done for you. But... But did you see the moonwalking bear? Same clip again. Same. Oh, there's always one party pooper. You will wet the bed now. No! The fact is, as everything is changing around us, here's what tends to happen inside our organization. And the research shows us this. We tend to focus on what's right in front of us on our desk. The reason that we do that is we feel like by the time Friday comes, if we say, well, I've concentrated on everything here, and I've ticked all those boxes, by the time Friday comes, I feel like I've achieved something. I feel like I've done something. However, when we do that, we miss the opportunity to do this, to step back from the work that we're doing and look at it from a bird's eye view and think and challenge and ask ourselves, can we do this differently? Can we do this better? Can we do this more effectively? So that is one of the underlying themes that we're going to be talking about through the course of my session today. And I suppose when we look at this context of change, I've thought really deeply about how this affects the education sector in particular because some of the huge changes you're experiencing now were just starting to come in five, six years ago when I started to uh, spend less time at the university. And the research shows us that change affects us in slightly different ways. These are the things that get eroded first inside organizations that are going through change. These are the competencies and skills that disappear first. The first thing is decision making. That's the ability of someone somewhere to say, good, bad, or indifferent, I think this is the right thing for us to do. When everything's changing around, it's so much easier to kind of hope that someone else does it or to wait and say, look, two or three years from now, we'll be in a much clearer place. We'll make a decision then. And by the way, this is the same thing that leads to, you know, that CC culture where you CC everyone in in the Western Hemisphere, so that if something goes wrong with a decision, you can say nine years from now, well, I see saved you on it, and you didn't get back to me. Um, the second thing is motivation. That's that little fire that makes an individual feel connected to the work that they're doing. And finally, observable innovation. These are the first three things that suffer inside organizations and sectors as they're going through times of change. However, separate research shows us that the very skills that we need to deal with this type of change and the pressure on budgets that you're all experiencing are the very things uh, that, we, uh, that we're not good at in times of change. Decisional confidence, the ability of someone to say this is the right thing for us to do. Professional enthusiasm, that's that little spark that makes us feel connected to the work we're doing. And new product solution or generation. Now, this is the science bit over. We get into the good stuff after this, but I know some people really want to feel the evidence base. Quite simply... This paradox shows us the skills that we need to deal with the change that you're all dealing with at the moment are the very things that we don't do well. So with that in mind, these are the things that we're going to be looking at through the course of my session today. We're going to be looking at how you can make better decisions yourselves. But more importantly, if there's an extraordinary innovation that you know will make a huge difference to your service users, how do you get the other people inside your organization to make the decisions that you need? Much easier than you think. Secondly, we'll look at um, on trying to understand uh, better how motivation works and then we'll start to look at innovative thinking and it starts with decision making you think you are good at decision making and I promise you you're not if I could borrow a handheld mic please um, it's the one thing that we think we are good at but as human beings we tend to be most flawed at so I need someone to help me with this this is where everybody says if I don't look them in the eyes then I'm invisible uh, it's going to be you sir nice and loudly into the mic what's your name my name is Dom no your name is mortified Let's hear it for Tom, everybody. Round of applause for Tom. 
Dom. Uh, oh, Dom, Dom, excellent. Uh, you're going to help me as well, sir. You're going to be a microphone stand. Something <laughs> of a career highlight for you, I sense. Uh, so, Dom, you've got a really simple job. I'm going to have you think of uh, and make a really simple decision. For the benefit of everyone who isn't just as close as you, you've got a cup, a saucer, and a dice. I'm going to have you think of any number that you like on this dice. So, let's say, um, if you thought of the number six, you would turn it so the six is on the top, hide it underneath so you know that I can't see it, Dom. Does that make sense? It does, yes. Excellent. Now, make this decision in the same way that you would make any decision at work. So it's a series of options, and this is just an easy way for us to keep track. All right? Yes. Excellent. I'm going to turn away. Dom, turn it so that your number's on the top. And Dom, when you're happy, there's no way that I can see it, and it's properly hidden. Give me a nice loud yo-ho when it's safe for me to turn around. Yahoo! Excellent. <laughs> Don't milk it, Dom. It's not a double act. Um, Dom, is your number on the top? Yes, it is. Is yeah. it hidden underneath the cup? It is. And yes. I wouldn't see it if I was to turn around? No, you wouldn't. Great. Dom, did this feel like a random choice? Mildly. I think the pink shirt might have had something to do with it. Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. I can tell you're starting Are to get attracted me? to me, Dom. Yeah. That's what I, I can tell that. Look, yeah. I meant what I said at the beginning. I'm married, so, you know, it's going to have to be your That's place, fine. Dom. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, Dom, did it feel like I manipulated you? It didn't feel like it, but I kind of guess you did. Here's what tends to happen first yeah. time around. First time around in decision making, we tend to fall into a trap that's called the recency effect. The recency effect is why you think a report that you received last week is more interesting, more venerable, more accurate than a report that you got last year. Even though the one that you got this week might have only had two or three respondents, the one last year might have had a thousand. So the last, last year's one's better. So uh, the only number that I mentioned to you was six. That was the most recent piece of information you had. I'd say you probably statistically went with the number six. Into the mic, what number did you go for? I went for six. Oh, he did. He did. Excellent. Let's hear for Tom. Well done. Now, Tom, I'll be honest with you, that doesn't always work first time around. <laughs> the fact that it did tells me that Dom is in the business, what we call easy. So, Dom, <laughs> it's me and you for the next half hour, princess. Um, so, <laughs> we're going to do this again uh, because you're my new favourite. Um, but this time you know how I did it. It's called the recency effect, so it tends to be the last thing that I would mention. Um, but look, I'm very subtle about it, so you probably won't even notice it, alright? So, this time, when I turn away, you're going to choose any number that you like. Just choose whichever number six in your head. <laughs> Okay. And by the way, you should change your number if I've tried to influence you. <laughs> Choose a number four or whatever reason, Dom. Should feel like a totally three choice. One and only one number will feel right to you. Yeah. But Dom, any, <laughs> any number that you like, Dom, turn it so that your number's in the top. When you're happy, there's no way that I can see it. Again, give me a nice loud yo-ho when it's safe for me to turn around. I'm ready. I need a yo-ho, Dom. yo -ho. <laughs> The only thing I will say, Dom, a person who chooses the number six, you won't have done this, this would be too obvious, tends to just go with uh, a central number, like three or four, tend to go with four, uh, but you won't have done that, that would be too obvious. What number did you go for? Into the mic? Maybe four. Oh, d he did go with four. All right, let's hear for Dom. Well done, Dom. All right, Dom, now, you're, uh, you're making... Would you come on tour with me, Dom? Would you, yeah? <laughs> Look, I'll be honest, it doesn't always work as regularly as this. Um, so here's what everyone thinks, Dom. Everyone yeah. thinks that as I'm turning around, I'm somehow sneaking a peek underneath the cup, all right? So to make sure that isn't the case... Uh, no, no, I'm not. Okay. Um, so to make sure that isn't the case, this lady's going to help me, if you don't mind. What's your name? Ruth, pleased to meet you. Ruth, um, so don't choose your number just yet. Now, Ruth, when I take these off, it renders me virtually blind. Uh, but, oh, a little bit grabby there, Ruth. Stealing's wrong. Uh, stealing's wrong. If we could count the chairs when Ruth goes. Don't choose your number just yet. Ruth, the way this is going to work is you're going to take your fingertips and place them against my eyeballs. So you know that, oh, super. <laughs> straight in there, Ruth. People usually ask for an explanation, but you're straight into that Fifty Shades position there, Ruth. <laughs> okay. Should we come up with a safe word first, Ruth? Or if I say broccoli, will you let me go? Is that okay? Excellent. So you did it perfectly. Frighteningly, but perfectly. Go ahead, hold down the eyelids. So are you happy, Ruth, that I definitely can't see? Yep. Excellent. Uh, Dom, go ahead and choose your final number for me. Turn it so that your number's on the top. Fingertips, not fingernails, Ruth. Um, and Dom, when you're happy, there's no way that I can see it. Give me a, How do you spell gouge? It's for the police report. Um, uh, Dom, give me a nice loud yo-ho, and it's safe to, uh, for me to guess your number. 
Yahoo! Excellent. So no stay there, Ruth. I'm starting to like it. Um, statistically, at this point, most people in the room will have thought of the number six. Uh, uh, so don't react as I say any of this, Dom. Then the number one, then the number four, then the number two. I would say, if I had to guess, I'd say you've gone with... Now, don't react as I say this. I'd say you've gone with the number two. Turn it so the two is on the top, hidden it underneath the cup. Now, don't react. But I'd say at the last minute, you've changed your mind and gone with the number three. Now, Ruth, if I could just... Going to take a little while for the blood to get back into those, but thank you, Ruth. Let's hear for Ruth. Thank you very much. And I'll get my glasses back. Oh, you've touched the entire surface of the glass. Good. <laughs> Both sides as well. You've been very thorough. It looks like you've cleaned them with a slice of bacon. Um, so after all of that, Dom, I think you should have ended up on the number three, nice and loudly into the mic. What number did you go for? I went for the number three. Oh, give Dom a round of applause. Good man, Dom. Thank you very much indeed. Cheers. Thank you very much indeed. I'll take that. Thank you very much. I'll take that. One more time for Dom, everyone. Thank you, Dom. Now, it is always hideous being the first one up, so I do appreciate it. Well, how does that work? Well, simple minds, easy molded. But over and above that, uh, when we make decisions, now, the, genuinely, the first one is a one in six, so that doesn't always work. So I kind of lucked out on that one. But once we understand the context and the shape of, that most human beings make decisions, we can use that to get the things that we need. Now, I'm going to give you an ethical uh, warning before we get through here. The next four or five slides, you can use them to get people to say yes to things that they don't want to say yes to, but you know that you need. That's not what this is about. This is about making sure that whatever the innovations that you've explored over the last three days of this conference, when you go back and you want to try and get that engagement, get that critical buy-in for it when you move back to your workplace, how do you present it in a way that doesn't self-sabotage it, that presents it in its very best light so you know you can get the yes that will make the big impact to their service users? So how do you do it? Well, um, it's going to start with a little challenge for you. Exactly the same as we've just done with Dom, I want you to imagine for a moment that you're presenting a series of options to someone inside your organization. One of them is the one that you want them to go for. This could be the one that's most uh, internally profitable. This could be the one that's easiest for the department. This could be the one that you know is the most sustainable, will have its longest life, will have the most longevity. Um, or maybe it's the one that's just easiest for your department to fix quickly. This is the one that you want. You want someone to either invest money or time in this, or at least just to say, yes, go and explore that idea. Where do you present the one that you want them to go for? Do you present it at the very beginning so that it's all singing, all dancing? Or do you build up towards it? at the end so it's like uh, neon lights feather boa or do you put it somewhere in the middle the only clue that I'll give you is that by the end of the session this has got to be the one that feels like the information is most fresh in their mind so what would you do don't try to second guess the answer just think about what you would do position number one number five or somewhere in between you've got 30 seconds now amongst your groups talk about it what do you think what would you do go All right, folks, let's see. Now, remember, don't try to second guess it. Let's just go with what you think the right, uh, uh, what you would do. So, this gentleman here, I've had you in a second. What would you do, sir? Number one, number five, or somewhere in between? I tend to go for number two. Why? I, I don't know. <laughs> Thanks for taking part. Appreciate that. Excellent. Uh, madam, here, what do you think? What would you do? Number one. Number why? Why number one? Uh, because that's um, in the mind. By the time they get to the end, they've lost interest. Oh, so they've lost interest at the end? Okay, all right. That's quite manipulative but of you. That's lovely. My, my colleague persuaded me to say it's number five. Oh, she persuaded you to say that? Okay. What a pleasure you must be to be in a relationship with. <laughs> well, uh, let's have a show of hands and see what the room thinks. Raise your hand for position number one, nice and high, nice and high. Okay, a couple there. Position number two, nice and high. Few. Position number three, uh, maybe five or six there. Uh, position number four, oh, quite a lot for there. And position number five. Ah, okay, so most people's position number five. Well, the correct answer is always, always, always 
It's position number three. Round of applause for those who got position number three. Well done. You're roughly 200% more likely to get it if you place it at position number three. All other things being equal. Same information presented in a different order. Now, why is that the case? By the way, gentlemen at the back taking it slightly too seriously. No need to punch the air, sir. It's literally a one in five. Um, starting to worry about your home life, though, if that's what you're celebrating here. Um, so whatever you present at position number one is almost always a disappointment. Never present the thing that you want at position number one because it will never align with whatever their preconceived expectations were of the solutions that you might present. They might have been expecting something really informal. You come in with something really detailed. Um, or, of course, the opposite is true. Now, I will say that I use the terminology pitch here, um, but truthfully, um, these have been found to be every bit as effective as the coffee conversations or conversations inside the corridor. So um, at position number two, it, you should use that as a point of education to show the type of space and scale and scope of the solutions that you're talking about. However, the research shows us that they tell themselves they'd be really bad decision makers if they made a decision so early. So they wait to hear all of the facts. Now, for about nine reasons, position number three is the big one. But I'll tell you the two most interesting. The first thing is that human beings tend to only be able to hold three pieces of discrete information in their mind at one time. When a fourth one's introduced, they start to feel like they've got a little bit too much information and they hanker back to that sweet spot where they felt they had comfort with the information. But also, we know that at position number three, they feel like subject experts in the area. They feel like they know more about the issue than you. You're much too close to the problem to be able to make a reasoned decision. But here, from my bird's eye view, I can see it so much more clearly. So there are lots of other reasons around dissonance and things why it's number three. At position number four, they use it to back up that good feeling that they got at position number three. And in position number five, the research and the evidence shows that they only retain about six or seven percent of the information presented at number five. So, uh, now I get loads of questions on this. I mean, not here, obviously, but um, uh, th some of them are. Some people say, well, look, what if I've got seven or eight or nine options? Is three still the magic number? Yes, it is. It's always three. You shouldn't present that many options, but if you have to, three is still the magic number. Uh, some people say, well, look, what if I've only got one or two options? Make one up and put it at the start. They're not going to pick it anyway. So, uh, now, they do get uh, a little bit more difficult. Imagine now for a moment there's a, a program or a course of action or a project you want to get off the ground, but you know it has fundamental weaknesses. Now, I'm not talking about small weaknesses, I'm talking about big ones, like this project won't wipe its face or won't cover itself for three or four years. Maybe you don't have the expertise in the house. These are the big challenges. But where is the most persuasive place to present those weaknesses? Is it more persuasive to mention them at the very beginning or at the very end? You can't put them in the middle. If you were to toss a coin, get this right, you're 240% more likely to get a yes for whatever the project is that you want to get off the ground. But which is it? What would you do? 30 seconds amongst your groups now. Go. Fifteen more seconds. All right, folks, I think we're nearly there. Let's have a show of hands again. Raise your hand for early in the presentation, very early. Okay, that's about 50-50. Raise your hand for late in the presentation. It is 50-50, and it's almost divided the room, actually. It's like we're in Northern Ireland here. <laughs> but yeah, I'll be honest with you, in my talks, when we have a split like this, it's tradition that we settle it with a tickle fight. So if you... Uh Dom was straight in there, weren't you, Dom? <laughs> so I'll maybe start with this gentleman here, sir. What do you, what do you think? I thought I'd get it out early. Why? Why is that? Um, because you want to end up up in a positive. Okay, excellent. Yeah. And what about you? I, I went late because uh, just on the basis of what you said before that uh, by the end people have lost interest and not really listening. Okay, all right, okay. Uh, well, um, I'll tell you, the answer is 240% tested cross-culturally in loads of places if you present it early. So round of applause for those who got early, I think. So let me tell you why that's the case. Let me tell you why. Um, by presenting, I happen to think that this is a very Northern Irish quality, all right? You walk into a car yard and someone says, Dave, 
I have the yoke for you. This thing is fantastic. It's a thousand miles. It's only one year old. It's had one woman driver. She was blind. She just used it to keep books in the back seat in the driveway. Cheap to run. Cheap to maintain. Cheap to look after. This is the car for you. So tell me, what happens? What happens? Yeah, yeah, what's the catch? You start to recoil, don't you? You start to think, no, 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 no. There's two bodies in the boot. I know it. Um, The minute that we start to feel flogged, 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 this is brilliant, this is brilliant, this is brilliant, we start to look for something, anything that undermines that. And the minute that you get to it, and irregardless of what you're talking about, I don't care what the project is, what the solution you'd like to apply in your organization, it does have some weakness or something that it doesn't do, whether it's a cost or a human capital weakness. If you put that at the very end, the minute that they get there, their nostrils were waiting for it, they sensed it was coming, it undermines not only that pitch, but the entire conversation and the relationship up until that point because they feel like they can't trust you at that point they feel like they were being flogged however place it at the very beginning and uh, we've tested this and rated this they rate you as much more honest reliable trustworthy transparent um, and much more likely to be able to get a project off the ground so always place it at the beginning 240 percent now the only thing that i will say is don't start by saying here is why this is crap that's not that's not how you start Start by saying, look, I should say, you'll do your own feasibility study on this, but I should say from the beginning, here are three challenges that we're dealing with this project. I just want to get those out at the get-go because we're really top of mind with these. We've got, they're, they're front and center for us. And here's how we plan to ameliorate for those and, and account for those things. By placing it at the beginning, you look so much more thorough than any other project that might come across their desk. So always place it at the very beginning. I use this stuff when I propose. She doesn't know we're married yet, God love her. So uh, now they do get a little bit more difficult. This time, imagine there are two projects or courses of action that you want supported. One is very expensive. So it could be a giant cloud computing facility off-site to back up your data. And uh, one is very cheap. So, I don't know, toasty maker in the staff room. Doesn't really matter. One's very expensive. One is cheap. You need at least one of them to be supported. Um, It'd be great if you got both of them, but at least one of them. But which is the more persuasive order to ask for it in? Do you ask for the big thing first, terrify them, then follow up with a small one because maybe they've said no to the big thing? Or do you start small, start and get that engagement, get that buy-in, get them saying yes and build up to the big one which is more persuasive you're roughly somewhere between 140 and 200 percent more likely to get that yes if you do this in the right order but what order would you do it in 30 seconds now amongst yourselves what do you think go Uh, let's have a show of hands. Raise your hand for big thing first. Big thing first. Okay, that looks like it might be a split again. This never happens. Sorry, Dom. It's tickle fight again, princess. Uh, raise your hand for small thing first. Small. Th- it is. It's a split again. Well, the answer is always, always, always. 
Oh man, I'm such a loser. It's both of them, but in different circumstances. I've got literally, I've got literally no friends, no friends. So let me tell you what those circumstances are. If you're dealing with someone senior to you, always, 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 and this is larger than, than the 120, 140 percent. This is nearly 200 percent. Always go with uh, the the big thing first. Why? Look, we may not feel like it. And by the way, the definition of senior is someone that you report to administratively or financially administratively or financially well you look it may not feel like it but they want to say yes they like to say yes they feel good about themselves as managers and leaders when they say yes when an individual says yes to another individual in the workplace get a little shot of endorphins and that feels amazing um, however the research also shows us that if an individual says no to someone inside their organization they're up to 400 percent more likely to say yes to something after that so the trick is to ask for something on the very realm of affordability um, and if they say no to it, follow up with whatever the, the cheaper option, cheaper solution towards the same job is, and you're dramatically more likely to get it. Um, the only thing I will say, do ask for the big thing, ask for something that you do need, because in about 0.7% of the cases, they say yes to it. So, you know, don't ask for a bouncy castle. Ask for something you do need. However, if you're dealing with someone junior to you, so much more important to get engagement and buy-in first. Um, start small. So uh, by starting small, they understand why you're asking for what you're asking for, and they're much more likely to get that result. So an example might be, um, Mary. Mary, I know you usually finish at 5 on Wednesdays, but it's coming up to the end of Q3. We need to pull together some figures. It would take us two hours to do it during the day. Everyone's around getting into the filing cabinets. It would be a nightmare, but give me 15 minutes after work on Wednesday. Everyone will be out of the way. It'll be so much quicker to do it. So you're asking for a really small thing, but also you're putting the bad news first. You're saying, look, I want you to stay back. You're having that very front end, um, and uh, by doing that, you're dramatically more likely to get her to say yes. So somewhere between between, depending on the case, sometimes 110, 120, um, and sometimes 160 percent, just depending on the context, but always dramatically increase your likelihood. So start small. Mary will say, yes, it is easier. It does make more sense. Easier for me, easier for our colleagues. Yeah, I will. I will stay back until, until 5.15. Dramatically more li might likely to say yes to that. So she probably will say yes. And when it gets to 10 past 5, say, sorry, Mary, it's going to be 9.30. So start small and then get bigger. So uh, last uh, one that I want to do before we move on, uh, before we move on, uh, you want someone to do something for you. Which is more persuasive? This is about 400-ish percent, depending on the context. Is it more persuasive to highlight the benefits of a course of action or a solution or a project or highlight the losses or dangers of not doing this thing? We'll do this quite quickly because I think you'll get this one. So 30 seconds amongst yourselves. What would you do? Go. All right, folks, we'll go for a few questions, because this, this one's usually quite a quick one. If you don't mind, I'll go to this lady here. Madam, what's your name? Nicola. Hello, Nicola. Everyone say hi, Nicola. Hi. Just like the AA, Nicola, that's coming in your future, I sense it. Um, <laughs> Nicola, what do you think? What would you do? Go with the dangers first. Why losses are dangerous? Because I think we instinctively protect. Okay, all right. I feel like I just switched on Radio 4 for a moment there, Nicola. <laughs> uh, what about you, sir? I agree. Totally. Oh, thanks so much. Brilliant. That's a really rich discussion. Um, so, <laughs> what about you two? What do you think, ladies? Uh, we'd go with um, the benefits first. The benefits? Okay. Why the benefits? Just because I think you're most more persuasive if you're giving somebody a positive picture than all the negatives. Okay. And you both agree on that? Yes, we do. Or did she positive mind freak no, you into no, it? No, or agree. Okay. Well, the answer is, and look, I hate this one. I absolutely hate it, but it is the losses are dangerous. Sorry, girls. It is the losses are dangerous. And the reason I hate presenting this one is because I know you all hate this because this feels like scare tactics. You don't want to go to anyone inside your organization and say, oh, well, look, if we don't do this, we're doomed because that feels like the worst possible way to present something but the truth of the matter is losses or dangers are sticky and adhesive as human beings we love bad news bad news is delicious to us 
you could raise a fortune for cancer research on Saturday uh, running a marathon. On Sunday, you can have a bake sale for motor neurone disease, raise a fortune there. Monday morning, you're in the car in traffic, you hear about a train accident in Mexico. That's all you talk about all week because we love bad news. Bad news is roughly three times more likely to be re retold than good news. So, and, and the research in this started in the 50s with a toothpaste company. Now, I work for the BBC, so I'm not allowed to mention any brands, so I'll make one up. Oh, let's call it Molgate. Um, and they used to have uh, uh, aspirational marketing, which is the same thing that everyone else used to do. They would have a beautiful 1950s housewife, figure of eight, two beautiful children, husband, bowler hat, briefcase. They probably weren't even related. She would hold up toothpaste and say, oh, well, if you uh, use, I nearly, I nearly said it there, if you, if you use Molgate, uh, then you can have a life like ours. And people kind of felt like, well, if I buy that, then I can be like her. Now, what a lot of people didn't realize was toothpaste in the 50s was essentially unrefined peroxide powder in a paste form. So your teeth would be incredibly white, but it would slowly dissolve your flesh if you used it two or three times a day. Really aggressive stuff. Um, however, in the early 60s, same company changed it, and instead of showing beautiful immaculate teeth and a beautiful lifestyle, they showed horrible, nasty, it might have been the same model if you used it every day, and uh, they said, if you don't use our product, then you can have a life like ours. Uh, they became the market leader, and depending on the index that you look at, now not everywhere, uh, in many cases they still are. Think of every advert that you've seen in that type of space. It's always, always, always bad news, because it's sticky and it's adhesive. But the trick with this one is not to say, well, if we don't go with this new server system, it's all over for us. Um, instead, it's to say that, Look, I need to let you all know, in the interest of transparency and due diligence, that if we don't go with this option, these are some of the things that might happen, and we're going to need to deal with those when the time comes. So don't do it in a scary way. Do it in the, in the context of transparency and due diligence. So always present it. Always, always, always losses or dangers, but always present them with a solution. That's what makes them stick. Now, this one is the most transferable one before we start to move into uh, uh, motivation. Um, the most transferable one that you'll take away from this session, all of those that we've talked about so far, if you're ever presenting a series of options, you'll just remember what you you have to do. You don't need to practice that stuff. You'll just remember it. But this one is the one that you will use most. You'll use it in almost every email that you send from this point onwards. You'll use it when you're dealing with your kids. You'll use it when you're dealing with your colleagues. Um, this one is amazing. You have all seen that little card in hotels. I, I'm in hotels about three or four nights a week because I have an amazing marriage. And that little card that says, here at XYZ Hotel, we're super duper concerned about the environment. You've seen it, yeah? We're so concerned, we would love it if you helped us protect the environment by reusing your towels. Now, by show of hands here, how many of you reuse your towels when, when you see that card? Liars, it's 6%. Put your hands down, liars. Um, so, um, uh, on average, somewhere between 6 and 9%, but it's, it's, it, the, the average figure is about 7 um, So, um, generally, people don't do it. Now, I used to be a hotel manager years ago in Washington, D.C., in a place called DuPont Circle, and I can tell you, as a hotel Hotel manager. Now, I care deeply about the environment now, but back then, I couldn't have given a monkeys about the environment. It saved us a clean fortune if we got you to reuse your dirty, stinking, sweaty towels two days in a row. Saved us a fortune because it was a variable cost. Um, so, the question is, um, how did we increase that? Now, it wasn't us. It was someone else's study, but we applied it in the hotel. And Friday to Monday, we got it from, uh, it was actually 8% in that hotel, but uh, generally uh, 8% to over 21%. Over 21% Friday to Monday. But how did we do it? I know this feels like it isn't related to the IT sector, but the learnings from this one are the ones that you will start to move uh, and, and apply and, and use immediately when you get back. So how would you do it? I need you to come up with a sentence or a plan each. You've only got 60 seconds to do it. Talk about it amongst yourselves. How would you do it? How would you get more people to reuse your tiles? Go, now.
Uh, I'm going to do a, a, a tiny quick run around. We had two interesting ones from here. Uh, so, so give me a summary of, of what yours were. So we, we said that you could um, you know, save the money and use that money to go to a ch charity in Africa and then just put it like a really you know, like a starving child or something. So guilt the person. A starving child in the room. That's a lot of work, but I see what you mean. the clean water we would have used. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and the alternative, because we were thinking about danger, you say, well, we will re wash your towel, but we'll only do it with water and not with any detergent. There we go. <laughs> you know this is hotels, not prisons we're talking about, yeah? <laughs> okay, excellent. Okay, any other suggestions here, folks, madam? What did oh, you think? Ours is quite similar to use, like, fluffy pandas or something as a guilt mechanism. Fluffy Pictures pandas, and is the panda tails. dead, or...? <laughs> <laughs> An endangered species. Okay, all right. Anyone else? Dom, what did you get? Well, we had a couple of ideas. Steve, what was your first idea? Oh, well, we first nice throw there, Tom. <laughs> nice throw. Uh, we first talked about making it chargeable. Then we thought about making it inconvenient. You had to do something specific to make them wash your towels. Okay. Uh, but what we finally came up with was stop giving them the choice. Just say, we wash your towels every other day. And then you'd explicitly have to phone up and complain if you wanted something different. Okay, all right. Uh, no one has tested that, actually, so I don't have any information on that. The ones that are sort of guilt trip, that does take it to over 10% in the, uh, the higher-rating hotels, four or five-star, but made no difference to one to three-star. They don't care, those people. Um, I should say, by the way, in the interest of transparency and disclosure, for me, when I'm in hotels, even today, I always want fresh towels, because in case you hadn't noticed, I'm kind of a princess. Um, well, the answer, to tell you the answer, I need to show you a video. Um, so... Um, now, we as human beings, I know that you think that from the decision-making exercises that we did earlier, um, you think that you are, um, you know, you've got free choice. You think that you are, um, you can make fairly good decisions. You think that when you're presented with a series of options, you can choose it fairly freely. You think that you're an independent individual. However, you're not. We are herd animals. You don't think you are, but you are. And when groups of us move in certain ways, all we want to do is be like that group. And the bigger that group is, the more likely we are to do that behavior, irregardless of how ridiculous, zany, unexplained, or irregular the behavior is. It doesn't matter. When we see groups of people, the bigger that group is, the more likely we are to do it. So, all they did was change the wording on that card. Instead of saying, here at XYZ Hotel, we're super duper concerned. They changed it to say, most people choose to help the environment by reusing your towels. Now, if you think about that for a second, you're standing there reading this card, and you think, well, I'm most people. Because when we see groups of people behaving in a certain way, all we want to do is be like them. Now, this research started with goths. Do you know what I mean by goths? Yeah? I see a few closed piercings in the room. Yeah, there's a few former goths here. They say, I'm an individual, I'm separate, I'm different, I'm unique, I'm completely individual. That's why I'm dressed in the same as these hundred other goths and standing with them outside City Hall. Because we feel the need to belong to something. And the bigger our, the group is, the more likely we are to do it. Now, we have tested this a hundred different ways. Um, we, uh, at one point, we got, uh, it's going to be on the one show before Christmas, so put it on on every TV in the house. I get paid for them all. And we got one person to stand in Covent Garden and look up at the top of a building. At nothing, absolutely nothing. Within six minutes, we had nine people standing with them looking at absolutely nothing and we went over to them and we said oh look uh, we're taking part in an experiment here we want to see how many people are going to stand and they were all like oh yeah well no we we plan to stand here we're meeting someone so but they were all looking up at the building so we said look do you mind hanging around just for a few more minutes to see how many people that we can get here so uh, th there was roughly 10-ish of them standing there at that point uh, within nine minutes we had 23 people standing there looking up at absolutely nothing and at this point Two people in the group started tweeting pictures. They were like, there's a guy, he's going to jump. There's no one, there's nothing on the roof. So um, then we went over and we said, look, would you mind if we tried this one more time just to see how many we can get? Well, it turns out that it went to well over uh, 30 people and it was quite close to a taxi rank. So the taxi drivers were complaining to the police, which is not like taxi drivers. Uh, and they said, look, these guys are affecting our business. So we got moved off. We think we'll be able to counted in the footage, but we think it was 34, 36, something like that. We are herd animals, and irregardless of how silly, mad, and zany the behavior is, all we want to do is be like the big group. Now look, I don't want to get heavy, the last talk of the conference, um, but this is why some uh, good people have done some horrible things through history, just because they see thousands of other people doing it as well. However, they, you can supercharge this, you can ramp this up. 
one group of hotels, the Ritz Carlton Hotels, changed it. Uh, and they've got it from over 20% to nearly 50% in almost every single branch of the hotel. All they did was change the wording on the card. Instead of just saying most people, they said most people who stayed in this room. <laughs> Holy moly. That is absolutely terrifying. Because what it's doing, it's taking that reference group and moving them even closer to you. So the closer you can take that reference group, the more effective that it is. So think of this in the context of your workplace. Um, I had a big contract with McDonald's. They had a real problem in Peterborough. It was really difficult to get their staff to do their essential food hygiene certificate. It was taking them, on average, 16 weeks, which is illegal. It's supposed to be done within four weeks. All we did was tell those employees uh, during their, um, their job application process, most people get it within uh, four weeks. Would you be okay with that? And they said, yeah, yeah, I would be okay with that. Friday to Monday, um, well, it was monitored over, over three months. It went from 15 to 16 weeks down to five weeks, just by telling them that most people did that. Now, what we didn't, weren't able to test, because we were only doing it in one region, was if we said most people at your pay grade in the, in the position that you're applying for, we think that would have made it even more impactful. So think about it in the context of your own workplace. What is it that most people are doing that you need everybody to do? What are the, minority consist uh, the majority consistently achieving that the minority are consistently not? Sometimes the most effective thing you can do is just to tell them. Um, and think of this, I mean, I have a huge contract with uh, PwC, and uh, it's around personal effectiveness and getting people to achieve the targets that they set for themselves. And um, they have a real difficulty. They send out these reports every month saying, oh, 70% of people haven't put in their end of quarter results, 80% uh, of people put it in three days late. By doing that, you're normalizing it. You're making it seem like, well, most people are putting it in late, so absolutely, and I'm going to go for a coffee before I finish this. So what is it that you're communicating and accidentally jeopardizing your opportunity of getting the things that you need to deliver for your service users? However, um, there was one separate piece of work. I work in Harvard every October um, as part of our research round, um, and uh, I, I absolutely love doing it. And one of the projects that we pitched for, um, and we didn't get, I know, persuasion people, um, and we didn't get, uh, but one of the big four consultancy groups did, was to try and reduce the amount of souvenir things taken from uh, the Grand Canyon. Really big problem in the Grand Canyon. People are taking rock and plant artifacts, and if they keep doing that in 100 years, it'll be a very different place. We didn't get the gig. Uh, someone else did, and this is how they tackled it. They put up this sign, an incredibly effective sign. It kills me to say this, but they did a, an incredibly impactful job. And this is what it said last year. Nearly 20,000 people removed rock or plant artifact from the Grand Canyon facility. Please keep this place beautiful by taking only pictures and leaving only footprints. Ah. Oh. Doesn't that grab you in the belly, doesn't it? It's emotive, it's persuasive, it goes for the tugs on the heartstrings. And what do you think? Wouldn't it have had an incredible result? It's still there now if you go there today. The results of this were absolutely extraordinary. 29% increase in the amount of rock plant and rock artifact by observation. 29%? Now look, I happen to be from Northern Ireland. Do you see if I see a sign like that? I say, 20,000 people? Well, I'm having a couple. Absolutely, I'm going to fill a lunchbox and put these on eBay. Because that looked like most people. It isn't. It's a minority. But it looked like most people. 20,000 is a lot to an individual. So please be super careful about how you use these techniques because it's so easy to accidentally use them to jeopardize. So think about what most people are doing. Sometimes that's all you need to tell your people. So. Um, there's one last thing that I uh, uh, want to cover just before we wrap up. Um, the, uh, to do this, I want to spend a tiny bit of time looking at the science of motivation. Every single company I've ever worked for, Apple, Cisco, Cabinet Office, um, all of them do motivation incorrectly. So here's how it's going to work. I'm going to show you a four-minute video. I'm going to come back, talk about how you can apply this video in your workplace. What you're about to see is at the heart of every single ounce of motivation that exists inside you and inside your organization. And it's got nothing to do with targets, performance-related pay, or bonuses. I may run slightly over time, so don't kill me. Um, so, uh, and we will bring up this little video now, and we'll come back and talk about exactly how you can use it. You may think that the beauty and grace of ballet hasn't very much in common with the raw aggression of basketball. But today we're going to try and transform half of these performers from Darcy Bustles into Michael Jordans, using only the power of words. All the volunteers here today think they're taking part in an experiment to see if dancers can transfer their skills to sport. But that's not what's really going on. 
In fact, we're looking at the power of positive thought. Jackie's going to randomly split the dancers into two groups, then tell one group they have a natural gift for the sport, and the other they have no natural talent for the game whatsoever. The two groups will then compete to see who can score the most baskets in three minutes. The ballerinas have been told that Jack is a successful basketball coach with years of experience. This is essential as words have much more power when they come from somebody in authority. Hi there, thanks a lot you guys for coming down and uh, agreeing to help out with us today. Um, we're going to investigate how you can transfer your skills as ballerinas into basketball. So the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is the eight of you to work as a team, pass the ball around and shoot as many hoops as you can just to get warmed up. And then eventually we'll move on to the next stage of the study. So if you're ready, go ahead. While they're playing, the ballerinas think that Dr. Jack is assessing their skills. In fact, he might as well just be wearing a blindfold. For the experiment to work, he needs to select the two groups completely at random. Come on, cluster up. It's excellent, great stuff guys. Assessment over, it's time to split the dancers into two groups. He'll tell one group they're great, the other group they're rubbish. Um, right, so, number one, um, I'm afraid you're never really going to make it in basketball, so I'm going to ask you to stand over there, if you will. And number two, well, you were, quite frankly, pretty poor, I'm afraid, so uh, I'm also going to ask you to stand over there. Thanks a lot. Um, so, number three, you were great, fantastic technique, uh, really good, really good effort. If you could stand over this side. Number four, now you showed some real class and poise. Uh, clearly ballerinas put you in good stead, so I'm going to ask you to go over here. Number five, yeah, spectacular performance. You did extremely well. If I could ask you to stand over here. Um, what are we on now? Number six, right, again, absolutely brilliant performance. Uh, you've got a real eye for the ball, great potential. If I can ask you to uh, also stand over here. Number seven, um, you were... I'm sorry to say shocking, no natural talent whatsoever, if I could ask you to stand over there. Um, and number eight, mediocre is an understate, I'm afraid, if you could stand over there. Okay, great stuff. If, if you four could uh, possibly wait outside, we're going to get these guys to shoot a few hoops and then we'll get you guys in in a sec. So, so with half the dancers well and truly destroyed by Jack's harsh words, it's time to really go to town on his supposedly gifted team. You've got great natural talent, really good skill, technique, strength, poise. Everything about your performance was brilliant. So looking forward to seeing how you do in this. Um, I have no doubt at all that you will shine. So if the four of you could uh, form a horseshoe round the, the hoop, you get three minutes in which to score as many baskets as you possibly can. You need to use teamwork and you need to keep a cool head to get as many baskets as possible. So, off you go. I'll tell you when your time starts, if you could just take your positions. Are you all ready? Yeah. Good luck. Off you go. With praise still ringing in their ears, it's time to see if Jack's words have had any effect on their abilities. Great show. Amazing. Baskets are flying in thick and fast. That's it. Well done, guys. That was brilliant. Excellent work. Time's up, and at the end of three minutes, Jack's gifted team have scored a whopping 18 baskets. A fantastic total for complete novices. Now it's time for our second team to do the same task. And just in case they've forgotten the abuse that Jack gave them earlier, there's just time for a little bit more. OK, ladies, um, so based on your performance earlier, I'm afraid it was pretty poor all round. Um, it might have felt good, but your technique kind of betrayed quite a lot of flaws. Um, your accuracy wasn't great, and uh, your performances weren't really that good at all. But let's see what you can do. Team A did extremely well. They scored loads and loads of baskets. And what we're going to do now is get you to uh, operate as a team. The four of you are going to cluster around the basket. We're going to get you to shoot as many baskets as you can as possible in three minutes. Um, you've got quite a big, uh, a big hill to climb, but good luck. You're going to need it.
Jack's negative words seem to be having an effect. They're missing many more baskets than they're actually scoring. Close but no cigar, girls. Come on, you can do it. There we go. OK, thanks a lot, girls. Well done. You did much better than I expected. Um, Despite the misses, after three minutes, the second team scored 14 baskets. Not bad, but quite a bit less than the supposedly gifted team. Looks like Jack's words may have made a difference. Great, well, thanks a lot for that. Um, team A outshone Team B in every way, shape and form, I'm afraid. Um, but the reason for that is as follows. I am not a basketball coach. I am atrocious at basketball, and you guys are all much better than I am. I divided up the teams completely randomly, and by encouraging Team A, they did extremely well, and by deflating the egos of Team B, by making you feel like you were terrible and you were poor, you lived up to that expectation. So it was all a self-fulfilling prophecy. Team A did well because they were encouraged. Team B did poorly because they weren't. Now, by way of explanation, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking into Jack's ear there because, uh, you know, when we shoot something at home, if one of the 12 people who happen to watch the TV show are, are part of it, then they would know that there's some sort of psychological game there. But lots of people say to me, well, that's not a huge change, 14 to 18, that's not a giant jump, and I'll apologise, I'll run slightly over time if you don't mind, only an extra hour, an extra hour roughly. Um, uh, but that's uh, actually, that was the least impressive one that we shot on the day. Um, the reason we, uh, when you work for the BBC, uh, you have to show the least impressive one in case you're ever accused of misleading. We're not even allowed to report the average, but we can put a montage of all of the rest of the footage online. So, um, but 14 to 18, actually, some people say, as I said, it's not an amazing jump. That's an almost 30% change in performance. For what? didn't cost a single penny. No performance related pay, no bonus schemes, no targets. Just by telling a group of individuals, and more importantly, meaning it, that you believe that they can, will, might, must, or should, it dramatically affects their performance and comes out in every single thing that they do. The science behind this is called idiomotion. emotion. Now this is where it gets a wee bit cheesy. We might have to hug Dom. But every thought that you have physiologically manifests in some way. Convince yourself that this is the worst budget that you've got this year. This is going to be a nightmare. And yes, it might be but convince yourself that you can't do anything with it and it comes out in your performance but also everyone around you as well um, and you know I think there's so many examples of this Dom if you could stand here actually sit in that little front row for me there Dom did you miss me I can tell um, uh, we told uh, there's another way that we tested this we got a hundred students in a room and told them about a lesser known piece of research did you know Dom stick your finger up like that silver coins are bonded in a straight line the atoms sit all together it's called atomic linearity that's what makes silver coins much more difficult to bend. Um, so copper coins, however, are bonded in like a herringbone fashion. So there are gaps between the atoms. They don't have that atomic linearity, and that's what makes them easier to bend. Are you having a good day, Dom, are you? Yeah? Um, that's what makes them easier to bend. So you can relax now for a wee while. We told this to 100 people in a room, had them hang a pendulum over a silver coin, hold their hand absolutely still, and because of that atomic linearity, it moved in a perfect straight line when they held it perfectly still. But over the copper coin, because it didn't have that atomic linearity, when they held it perfectly still, it moved in a circle because I had given them a half hour PowerPoint presentation telling them about the science of this, about how it works, and we showed them five videos from the 50s when this phenomenon was originally discovered from five different universities. And we told them, and in 100% of cases, straight line silver coin, circle over the copper coin, and they gave us polite applause. And then we said, we don't want this to be about suggestions, so cover them up with a piece of paper so you can't see where the coins is. But remember, they knew where the coins were, and in the position where the silver coin was, still moved in a straight line, and still moved in a circle over the copper coin, and polite applause. My director called them over to the corner of the room and asked them, so what did you think of that? What they didn't realize was, and some of you might have, it's completely fictional, it's entirely poppycock. I don't know if atomic linearity means anything, uh, but it sounded the part, didn't it? And you had a good time, Dom, didn't you? So, but in 100% of cases, it worked with them all because they were told with authority and conviction and it came out in their performance. And this happens every single day inside our organizations. Convince yourself that something can, will, might, must, or should happen and it comes out in you and every single person around you as well. This is the real science behind achievement. But 
Um, this was that one that we show you is only one of the cases. Look at the rest of them. Uh, Forty-six percent change in performance. Uh, Fifty percent change in performance for what? Didn't cost a single penny. Seventy-seven percent. Twenty-eight percent is the one that we actually uh, report whenever it comes to it. Um, oh, I keep meaning to remove this G one, this uh, uh, the red one. It, it was actually the first one that we did in the morning time when I got a hundred and sixty-three percent change in performance. I thought it was getting the Nobel Prize. Shortly after it, my mum rang and she says, oh, how are you getting on? And I was like, oh, 163% change in performance. And she was like, you know I don't care. Um, what we didn't realise was, as part of that, two people represented the Commonwealth Games, just by pure luck. So we had to remove that from her now. Irritatingly, irritatingly. So those are the two that are in the boot of that car. That's for sale, by the way. Um, so, um, the science behind this, remember, is called idiomotion. Now, this is where it gets really cheesy and nasty. This isn't positive thinking. This is the science around connectedness into the work that we do. Um, and I think there are so many lessons that we can take away from this. Oh, by the way, when my director asked them in the corner of the room, what did they think of it um, about this? Three of them said, I'm actually very familiar with the phenomenon. Are you? Really? Two of them said they just watched a documentary about it on Discovery. Did you? No, you didn't. Um, wait till that footage comes out, by the way. I can't wait to see it. Oh, and the five videos that we showed them from the 1950s, it was just me with my head cut off. We got five jumpers out of Primark, so it looked like it was legitimately 60 years old. Um, but in 100% of cases, it came out with all of them. And this is at the very heart of every single thing that you do. On Monday morning, convince yourself that this is going to be the week from hell. And it is. Of course it is. And everyone around you feels that too. Um, the only thing that I will say, of course, I say that this doesn't cost anything. But it, the only thing that it does cost sometimes is ego. It takes an incredibly strong manager, leader, to, um, to sit down with an individual who isn't performing and tell them that, irregardless, you absolutely believe they can, will, might, must, or should. And you're going to build a support structure around them that gets them uh, the, the support that they need to do their very best work. It's really, really difficult to do that from a management point of view. But if you can, the results are absolutely extraordinary. Uh, now, I know that this, for you to take this away and apply it, it involves a, a bit of an investment, a bit of change in behavior. For you to take any of the things that I've talked about today involves you taking a bit of a risk and going back and saying, you know what, I think we could do this differently, guys. And I need you to do it because that's the only way that this information becomes alive. So if you give me just four more minutes, I think it's only fair if I'm asking you to make an investment uh, that I should make an investment in, uh, and take a bit of a risk one of you as well. Dom, uh, you're going to select someone randomly. We're going to throw this a few times. Whenever you're ready, go ahead and give it a good throw around the room to anyone you like. I don't mind. Wow, that was quite a good throw, Dom. You would have been very useful in the troubles. <laughs> Sir, you got it. What's your name? Bruce. Reassuringly middle class, Bruce. Bruce, have we set anything up? Have we pre-prepared anything? Uh, did We didn't meet in the car park or anything? No, I've got the wrong Bruce. Is there another Bruce? So Bruce, you've got, you can stand up for me. Give Bruce a round of applause. Bruce, you've got quite an important job. You stand in the middle there for me, Bruce. Bruce, I'm going to have you think of a celebrity, someone in the public eye, someone who, Bruce, if you were to name their name out loud, you're certain everyone here, you can stand up at the front, would know who you're talking about. Now look around the room, Bruce. We've got a mixture of ages, genders, even um, uh, people from all over the world. Um, it, it's got to be someone that everyone would know, Bruce. Have you got someone? Stand there over the trap door for me. Bruce, have you got someone? Excellent. Now, if you think I already know who this is, you have to change your mind. Because maybe this is a setup, Bruce. Maybe this is all pre-prepared. Maybe I set up CISG years ago just to get you right now. And these are all my cousins. Um, so you need to know that whoever you... Take your hands out of your pockets. I'm providing the entertainment here, Bruce. So you need to know that whoever, whoever you think of now is someone who just popped into your head. Yep. Got someone? Yes, sir. Now, you're not going to show this to me just yet, okay? It isn't quite a secret, but you're not going to show it to me just yet. You're going to write down their first name and their last name. They do have to have two names, so it can't be like Madonna, Rihanna. I can tell you're a fan. Um, uh, and you're going to fill up the entire space of the box, because at the end, we want even the live streamers to be able to see what you've written uh, nice and clearly, all right? So you're going to write down the first name and last name and fill up the entire space of the box. Keep it tight up against your chest. Make sure no one here sees, particularly the people from Northern Ireland. Um, and uh, go and do that for me now. I'm going to turn away, Bruce, as you do that. And as you do that, I'm also going to get you a present for being such a good sport. And let me know whenever it's uh, safe. Whenever you're done, close it, hold it up against your chest, and give me a nice loud yo-ho when it's safe for me to take a look at you. Excellent. So I need you to spell your full name for me, Bruce. B-R-U-C-E, I presume. And your middle name nice and loudly for me. 
Robert, okay, that's not embarrassing enough. Um, and your last name? Pearson, okay. Um, P E or P I? A, -A R S O N, okay, I'm going to sign that. What make of car do you drive? It's a Skoda. Okay, excellent. I have one of those. Um, and what uh, today's date is the 13th. Yeah, of the Lama 1-5. Yeah, well, it might be lucky for you, Bruce. Bruce, for the benefit of everyone who isn't quite as close as you, how much have I written that check for? A thousand pounds, and that's sterling, that's not yo-yos, that's the real deal. We could buy Limerick with this, Bruce. So, Bruce, if I can't work out who this is, you get to take this home. Ah, right. uh, glad you caught the wee ball now, aren't you, Bruce? <laughs> Put that inside your pocket for me, inside your pocket where you know I can't get to it. No, I can get to it there, Bruce, but anyway. Um, so, Bruce, all you need to do is say no to everything. So, make your way up onto the stage. Even if I get this right, Bruce, you keep saying no, 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 no. Does that make sense? No. Yeah, just say no. Does that make sense? No. Does it make sense? Good man, Bruce. Excellent. Bruce, so I've got two guesses. I need to get it within two guesses. We're going to do this really fastly because I'm horribly running over time. Bruce, um, is this say no? Is this a male? No. Female? No. Male? No. Male? No. Male? It's a male. Good man. Excellent. And that little smile confirms it. Thank you, Bruce. <laughs> Excellent. So uh, this time, think of uh, where this person is from. Now, the first guess won't be perfect, but it should, uh, should be close. Uh, Northern Ireland, no. Southern Ireland, no. Scotland, no. England, no. Wales, no. Canada, no. America, no. America, no. America, little no. smile America, don't react, okay. Uh, so remember the first guest won't be perfect, think of their job, singer, no. actor, no. politician, no. politician, no. politician, no. <laughs> politician. Um, <laughs> Uh, it, is it Barack Obama, say no, no. George Bush, no. Bill Clinton, no. Barack Obama, no. Barack Obama, no. Barack Obama, no. Uh, okay, close your eyes for me, Bruce. Okay, so this is guess one of two. Uh, so this won't be perfect. Apologies, that isn't very thick there. This won't be perfect. So, Bruce, here's how it's going to work. You're going to score guess number one in terms of accuracy, ten being most accurate, one being least accurate. Um, so don't react whenever you see it. Uh, I'll thicken this up a little bit for the people at home. So don't react whenever you see this. Um, now, here's how the scoring works. Ten is the closest. Uh, one is a thousand miles away. Um, now, remember, guess number one, for me to get perfect on guess number two, it kind of needs to be like, a seven. Um, so uh, the way you're going to score this is ten means perfect. Um, if they're if they're close, and by close I mean in the same family, then you give it maybe like a seven or an eight. If they're not even in the same family, so if they're not brother sister, not wife husband, then it's a one. If they're not in the same okay. family relationship, yeah, yeah. does that make sense? Yes. Great. So you're going to score this in terms of accuracy, nice and clearly into the mic. What score would you give it? One. Not, sorry, not related? Yeah, so if they're not in the same family, so if it's like husband-wife, then it would be like a seven or eight, but if they're not in the family at all... Of Barack Obama, yeah? Yeah. Yes, one. So do, you under, do you understand the rules, Bruce? Yeah. Sorry, sorry. So they're not even in the same family? They're not even like brother, sister, cousin, husband-wife? So wife? Barack Obama? Yeah. No, they're not related to Barack Obama. No need to look quite so delighted, uh, Bruce. <laughs> Okay, all right. Sorry, it's, it might be because I'm, I'm, I'm rushing for time. So let's just go back a second, say no to everything. Yep. Um, uh, Ireland? No. Scotland? No. England? No. America? No. England? No. England? No. America? No. England? No. England? No. Oh, I think I might have got the country wrong. Just a second. Oh, and that blink? Okay. Thanks, Bruce. Um, singer? No. Actor? No. Politician? No. Politician? No. Politician? No. Keep saying no, no, no matter what. Um, David Cameron? No. Tony Blair? No. Nick Clegg? No. <laughs> Politician. Um, Nick Clegg? No. Nick Clegg? No. All right, close your eyes for me. So, uh, you can open up your eyes. So what happened was, open up your eyes, Bruce. Um, what happened was I went down a slightly wrong road, which um, I suppose, so technically that makes this my first guess. So um, <laughs> now you were all so friendly up until a point, weren't you? Um, so no, joking aside, this is my last guess. Now the rules are, the only way I get the check back is if it's a perfect 10. 10 means there, it's spot on. Seven or eight means, I don't know, maybe it's, uh, I can't even remember his wife's name. Who can? Um, and uh, so if they're in the same family, if, 
But if they're, not, if they're not related, then it's like a one or a two. So what would you give this in terms of accuracy? A one. One? Not related. Is it properly miles off? It's not miles off, but there's no relation. Uh, who did you go for? Let me see. David Cameron. Oh, David Cameron? Well, he won the... Mo okay, give him a round of applause. He won it. Well, I'm not shaking your hand. Go. Oh, although, Bruce, before any of this started, before you even thought of someone, I wrote you a check. But who did I write the check to? <laughs> Don't let me touch it or people think I switched it. Who did I write who? the check to? Oh, you lost it. I've lost it. Yeah. Oh, my God. David Cameron. <laughs> Give a huge round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> so, one more time for Bruce. Thank you, Bruce. Um, I just hope he never meets David Cameron, that's all. So, folks, I'm sorry I ran over time. I really do apologize. The reason I wanted to end with that is that I think it has a really strong message about risk and reward. When you go back to your organizations with the bravery to try new things that you've picked up across the three days at this event or from my talk or from anyone else's, I know it takes a bit of a risk, but when you take that risk, the reward can be surprising and extraordinary. And it's what events like this are all about, going back and making those big changes. I've been so honored to join you here. Um, I've had inquiries for this conference the last two or three years and we've never been able to make it work so I really appreciate Gareth in, in suggesting and recommending me. Um, thank God uh, he would have been paying the thousand pounds if I got that wrong I can assure you. Um, so thank you so much for having me. I'm not disappearing so come up at the end and ask any questions. We won't have any group ones now just for timing reasons but thanks so much for taking part and your final applause for everyone who took part because I don't have a talk without them. Um, and I'll see you a little